my work has two major areas. Um, one is on corporate environmental performance. And I'm a criminologist, so usually criminologists focus mostly on crime, but there's actually a whole range of behavior that corporations engage in. Um, and in my research, we found that there's a small number of corporations that commit a lot of environmental crime, but then there's a really large number of companies that actually comply. And in a lot of cases, they're going beyond compliance even. They're polluting a lot less than what they can. So um, in my work, I try to look at the theoretical predictors of that range, try and figure out why companies would fall in different places on that continuum, and then also what kinds of regulatory strategies might discourage crime and also encourage compliance and overcompliance. The second major topic is environmental justice, um, looking at the distribution of hazards that are created by business practices. So what kind of communities do they end up in? Um, the environmental justice literature has looked primarily at the community demographic composition, things like racial composition and class composition. And um, for, you know, criminology is really heavily influenced from sociology, so I'm interested also in the social processes that might create that unequal distribution, what actually goes on in communities, um, and why, um, what happens in the interaction between the community and the businesses that, that create the unequal distribution across the U.S. Most of my work is focused on the U.S. There is definitely this assumption that companies are very rational actors and that's why they engage in not compliance. There's similar explanations for overcompliance. Um, they might do that because they can get some kind of benefit with regulators and, or you know, decreased monitoring, lower sanctions if they do have a criminal activity. Um, or that they're in anticipating stricter regulations, they just want to be on the forefront. Um, but there's another set of explanations that look, that are more, um, they call them deontological or moral-based explanations that companies over-comply because they think it's the right thing to do and they have an obligation to society to have better practices. Um, and so there hasn't been a lot of empirical research, but th so those are basically two theoretical schools of thought, but there isn't a lot of work evaluating them, and that's one of the things that I'm interested in doing. I have a new project with Ed McGarrell um, looking at, at carbon trading markets. And because, you know, in some sense, my work is really on regulation, compliance, and enforcement. And so you can really apply that to any kind of environmental problem. Um, and in my work, it's mostly corporate. So the cap and trade stuff, for, particularly for companies, is of interest to me. Um, and we're not very far into that. So <laughs> I don't have much of a response for you. but. But that is certainly one alternative way to regulate these kinds of issues. And I don't think that we know yet whether it's more efficient or more effective than other more traditional forms of regulation. So basically, there's an international trade in electronic waste, things like old TVs, computers, um, cell phones, anything that has a plug, I guess you could define as electronic waste. And NGOs have documented this movement of e-waste from developed to developing countries, and the United States is one of the primary players in that. And so we were asked by Interpol to do a profile of what U.S. exports of e-waste look like, because there's a whole variety of problems associated with them. Um, there's, there's some indication that there's organized crime activity that's intercepting these shipments or moving them, and then they end up in, dumped somewhere rather than legal disposal. Um, there's also businesses that violate the few regulations that we have in the United States. Um, and then there's issues of identity theft and data security with this. There, so there's ties to other kinds of crime. It is relatively new. There's a little bit, in the, over about the past 10 years, criminologists have started to look more at things like environmental crime. but it's relatively new, and I, I think that these, this, they call it, in criminology, they'll call it green crime or environmental crime. Um, it's really not very well developed because it's so new and because there's a pretty narrow range of perspectives that have been brought to, to light on these particular kinds of issues. So um, it, it's definitely new, and, and especially in incorporating risk and decision sciences into the natural resource criminological components. Um, and so w what we're trying to do in the classes and in the research program 
is to really combine the insights of multiple disciplines to address these problems because they really aren't discipline specific.